Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of July 29th, 2024. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss the movement we are seeing from the utilities on South Central gas supplies. Second, we discuss another bad week for the Permanent Fund Board and how the new chairman just made the case even stronger for replacing and restructuring the board. And third, we explain why the new child care or any type of tax credits are worse than subsidies. And now let's join Michael. All right, well, Brad, let's uh, let's without further ado, let's just let's just dive into this. Um, I was uh, pleasantly surprised to see an article come out in the ADN from uh, the folks who work over there at uh, Chugach Electric, Arthur Miller and Mark Wigan. Uh, we're finally starting to see some movement on this whole uh, South Central gas issue. Um, is it coming to fruition, or what, what's give us the give us some some details here? Well, Michael, we may have been, we may have been through a period of kabuki theater um, leading leading up to this. It may have been, oh, I really don't want to diversify my gas supply. I really don't want to leave the Cook Inlet. Please, please, producers in the Cook Inlet, please, you know, produce more gas. Please, you know, if we throw you some money, will you produce more gas? Oh, that's a bad idea, throwing more money, um, uh, state money at least. Um, and and we may have been through this period of kabuki theater, and now with the passage of, of the middle of the year, the, the, the sort of the target that they had set for themselves, we're seeing the reveal of, of where we're going on the Cook Inlet. Uh, Chugach came out most forcefully. Chugach had an op-ed in the ADN uh, last Friday, I think it was, by the uh, chief executive of Chugach, co-authored by the chief executive of Chugach and, uh, and the chairman of the board. Uh, and there's a sentence that's very clear. It says, while working to diversify our generation mix, gener uh, Chugach needs a bridge fuel supply to a renewable future, and that is imported LNG. Um, and I think uh, I think they've made clear that they're that they're on their way to trying to put LNG deals together. The pre the paragraph up to that point said, we must remain laser focused on ensuring reliable electric service, the certainty of reasonably priced natural gas, and increased diversity of electric power generation including renewable projects. Currently 80%, but, but currently 80 of Chugach's generation is produced using natural gas with hydro and wind making up the remaining 20%. And then the sentence, while working to diversify our generation mix, Chugach needs a bridge fuel supply to a renewable future, and that's imported LNG. They also hit one of the myths, I think, that have been spread uh, about uh, LNG. Uh, at least to some degree, and that is that that it was going to cause this huge price fly up uh, in South Central as a as a result of bringing in LNG. Right. No one ever mentions no one ever mentions that we were facing a price fly up anyway. Uh, when right. you look when you look at last year's uh, utility study, uh, the cost of going and getting additional cook inlet supply was greater than counting if if you subsidized it, counting the subsidies was greater than the cost of imported LNG. Nobody mentions, nobody bothers to mention that we were hitting that price fly up anyway. 
But here's here's what Chugach had to say about that. Concern has been expressed over the potential increase in your electric bill due to the cost of LNG. Your Chugach electric bill will not be going up 50% if we import LNG. We have heard this in other numbers over the past several months. For Chugach electric members, we estimate bills could go up approximately 10% when LNG uh, is imported in 2028. So that's that's Chugach, uh, the biggest uh, uh, consumer uh, of natural gas in the uh, in the South Central re region. Consumer in the sense that they buy it, consume it uh, to generate electricity. And then over on the the frontiersman, Tim Bradner had a couple of articles that uh, dealt with uh, LNG. And while LNG uh, didn't write an op-ed like Chugach did, didn't step out in front. Uh, and and say what they're doing, uh, it, it it was sort of re it was revealed uh, in Bradner's articles after talking to the M Star folks. Um, the first article last week was N Star tells regulators it will have planned to import LNG by year end. You'll recall that um, uh, N Star had filed for this fifty million dollar pipeline over on the Matsu side to go right. down to Port McKenzie and hook up, hook up potential an LNG source at, uh, at Port McKenzie. In the context of that proceeding, uh, uh, NSTAR had to answer, was sent some questions by the RCA and NSTAR answered those questions. And what Bradner is reporting on is, is a, a sentence in the, in those answers that NSTAR gave the LC, uh, RCA that said that they would, have um, a plan in place by the end of the year to uh, to import LNG. And then in another article, a follow-up article, um, Bradner did a couple of days later, Bradner uh, had a headline, Bradner wrote an article that had the headline, NSTAR in early discussions for use of Port McKenzie for LNG delivery hub. And the thing about, the, there's, there's two things that are interesting about this article. One is, is, it, it continues to follow up on the responses that Ella, that uh, NSTAR had given the RCA and said that they're, what they're looking at Port McKenzie for is a floating LNG, uh, FLNG uh, 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 operation. And FLNG is you bring in a ship. Uh, we've, they've done this in Europe. I mean, when, when, Russia cut, when Russian supplies were cut off to Europe, Europe's response to that was to bring in, was to go to LNG and bring in a bunch of FLNG, floating LNG. Uh, Which are basically uh, regasification. Their ships where all the facilities are built onto the ships and they float offshore and they regasify and then ship it on shore, right? Right. And so all you really need to do is to have a hookup on shore. You have a, you have a, the, the ship does all of the, brings in the LNG, regasifies the LNG. Uh, or ships bring in the LNG, a ship regasifies the LNG, has a floating LNG regasification plant on it. Um, a floating plant that's the equivalent of what would be a, what's on land over in Kenai. Um, and, uh, and, then, and then pipes the gas off the, off the ship on shore. And so what you, the really only shore facilities you need is, uh, is, a, are, is a, from the gas standpoint, is a gas pipeline to bring it into your system. You also need dock, a dock. For the flow for the floating LNG to moor against, um, and and part of the issue at Port McKenzie, I think, is building new facilities to be able to accept uh, a floating a floating ship. Uh, there's other issues uh, with, with floating LNG um, uh, as well, but what Bradner's article also revealed was that it was that LN or is that NSTAR hasn't committed to Port McKenzie and hasn't committed to floating LNG. Uh, that they're also looking at the Kenai facility and looking at reversing, you know, undertaking the construction necessary to reverse uh, uh, that facility to be able to, to turn it into a regas facility, as a regasification facility, as opposed to a gasification facility. Interestingly enough, when you look back at the at the phase one study, the utility phase one study, the costs, while they're different, while they come from different places, the cost of a floating LNG and the cost of a land-based L regas LNG facility uh, are approximately the same. Uh, again, they come from different places. I mean, the costs are different, but they but they tend to tend to get fairly close to each other. Uh, the the challenges at over at McCor Port McKenzie are going to be the additional dock work, the permits for the additional dock work, the permits for a floating LNG, whatever permits you need, marine permits uh, for a floating LNG. Uh, to have a floating LNG facility, 
also issues with permits over at, uh, at, at Kenai. I would say at this point, Kenai is ahead because Marathon had already got it uh, authorized uh, to, to accept out, to already gotten the permits necessary to turn it into a regas facility for Marathon's own use. Those, have, those would have to be expanded to include use for others. Um, but I would say that the, the Kenai is ahead and it's, and it's, and it's good to me to see uh, Bradner's article refer to, or quote uh, NSTAR, essentially quote NSTAR by saying that, that they're looking at both. So I, I think, I think finally, after, after however long that, well, the phase one presentation was a year ago, over a year ago in June of 2023. So I think finally, after a year of, of, of apparent uh, sort of uh, just running in circles, uh, we're finally making some progress. One thing, one thing, after all this, though, they still haven't released the phase two study. <laughs> oh, they still haven't put the phase two study out. So, I mean, you said early on that you thought this was kabuki theater. So was all of this just to gen up interest in it, to gen up money, to see if they could get some more money to the producers to some kind of uh, offset for building a pipeline. I mean, what do you think? I mean, what do you think is, uh, you know, what do you think is all, was all being what, you know, what was, what was the purpose of the theater, I guess? Well, you know, looking back on it and things John Sims has said along the way, I think, I, I think that Ellen, or I think that NSTAR didn't want to be out in front, uh, uh, even though, even though the phase one study was clear, I think I think NSTAR didn't want to be out in front saying we're going to go to LNG, uh, the sort of statement that you're now seeing from Chugach. I think NSTAR wanted to to look like it was, you know, it tried to keep Cook Inlet alive. It tried to keep Cook Inlet producers alive. It tried to, you know, do what I think it wanted to look like it was. I think Sims wanted to look like he had been trying uh, to uh, to. Uh, uh, respond to, to cooking up producers. But in the end, I think the phase one study made it clear. That's, that was where we were headed. Uh, and, and, you know, to me, I just sort of like to cut to the chase and get, and get on with stuff, right. This whole sort of Kabuki theater wouldn't have been, wouldn't have been what I would done, have done about it. But, but in looking back on it, it sort of looks like that may have been what was going on. And, and Bradner's lead in to one of the, uh, to one of his articles uh, sort of, sort of hints at that says, the lead in is no one is happy about this at the least being in star natural gas company, but yeah. gas, the gas distribution company for South central. They uh, didn't want, yeah, they didn't want to be the one to say, look, the answer is importing LNG uh, because everybody's got a love affair with, you know, using Alaska gas and doing the resources. And I mean, I'm on board with that. If it can be viable, if it can be economic. And of course we know it can't. So, but nobody wants to say the quiet part out loud. Nobody wants to be the party pooper in the room that says, mm, imported gas is going to be the cheapest solution for the next 10 years. Uh, nobody wants to say that. Um, and so that's what they were, they were doing all this essentially to avoid that is what you're saying. It, it, you know, looking back on it, one can make the case that that's, that that's what's going on. I mean, maybe yeah. genuinely they were, they were going in circles and they didn't know what, they didn't know what direction to go. Maybe. But, yeah. But, but looking back on it, it sort of looks that way. And, and, you know, I, I guess we had to have the fight about the subsidies for the cook inlet producers. We had to have the fight about throwing state money, additional state money at the cook inlet producers to, to keep them going so that right. everybody could say, Oh, I tried, I tried. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't the right, it wasn't the right, it wouldn't have been the right call, uh, more expensive supply than, than LNG. And I think now we're on with LNG. Joseph says, we just need 25 million to build it, 25 million in infrastructure and five years of environmental studies to make it happen. Sounds viable. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, kind of, I mean, isn't that what it kind of always boils down to, but if we don't get started on it now, I mean, I thought it was pretty interesting that that one article from the two guys at Chugach was basically like, when we start paying for gas in 2028, and I'm like, oof, you guys are ambitious. What, what are you going to get this done? I mean, you know, you better start now because it's going to be 2028 is fast approaching. Um, but yeah, this is, uh, you know, this is where we're at, Brad. 
Well, yeah, 2048 is fast approaching, but Did you just you know, mute, mute yourself because I didn't mute. Oh, no, I muted you. That was me. Go ahead. Right. <laughs> you're you're tired of listening. I'm tired um, of listening to you, Brad. Too much. Go ahead. 2020, 2028 is fast approaching. I was surprised by that also. There is there is an option. I mean, we've talked about it on the show before. There is an option of bringing in LNG by cylinders and 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 having a, a small regas facility, sort of a temporary regas facility around the cylinders, um, and that that's hugely expensive. Uh, but but you don't need much. I mean, the sort of the trade off is you don't need much LNG at the beginning because Cook Inlet Cook Inlet, as we've talked on the show before, Cook Inlet isn't just suddenly going to disappear. Cook Inlet is in gradual decline, and so the 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 delta the the portion that you need to fill with LNG isn't all that much at the beginning and maybe Chugach maybe Chugach is thinking that that they'll just bring in cylinders for that little bit that they need at the beginning um, or maybe they're thinking that that we'll have all this you know set up and ready to go that will be uh, uh, they'll have the decisions made by the end of 2024 we'll have the contracts in place we'll have the the author, the permits filed for, uh, will lean on to the extent their federal per permits will lean on Murkowski and Sullivan and and whoever our congressperson is to 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 press ahead on those and 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 maybe they're thinking that we'll get it get it installed by them. But either way, I mean, 2028 is a little aggressive, but it's good it's good to hear them say that 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 they're getting on with it after all of this after all of this period of radio silence and and sort of apparent on the surface non activity. <laughs> It's good to hear them say they're uh, that they're getting on with it. Now, I mean, I love the analysis of uh, you know they're all standing around going, "Oh boy, would nobody wants to be the first to say that we just won't be able to use Alaska gas. We'll have egg on our face if we do that." So everybody just you know cone of silence. Nobody says anything about it, you know, until somebody finally breaks it. But it it you know it is what it is. I mean, we've been we've been talking about it, and it, I mean, like I said, I've wanted to. I've been pushing for Alaska gas for. 20 years on this program but again the economics rule the day the economics have got to make it work and if you can't you know if you can't make the economics work then what are you going to do you know um, one, one of the advantages of floating lng is that an flng facility is that it's marketable right you don't install kit on the on on big kit on the shore that that then is sunk costs you've got this ship that that you're using to to regas and you've got pipes up to the ship but that's really all of your onshore investment and you can unhook the ship and float it away and you know send it someplace else where there's where there's where there's demand so it, it we're we're not writing out cook inlet i mean i i've made this point all along if the cook inlet producers have a big find or they find that their economics uh are are better than they than they claimed they were and they can do this stuff without subsidies and and bring in additional supply. We're not we're not hugely committed to to LNG at, at any given point, especially if we're using floating LNG, and that may be in the back of NSTAR's mind. And even over at Kenai, we've already got most of the kit there. It's really just a just a process of of sort of bolstering it up and turning it into and turning it into a, 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 a the other way to go. So I. Uh, Cook Inlet is not necessarily over. If producers find something in Cook Inlet, there still will be a market for it and a way to bring it into the system. Kyle's brought this up a couple times, and I, I mean, I don't think that I'm arguing uh, with Kyle about this at all. He says, do you believe the Jones Act challenges are being used as a red herring against imports? And I, I mean, I don't know if you mean the challenges that people are making to the Jones Act or anything else. I mean, I think that Jones Act definitely makes it tougher to import gas into Alaska because we can't use domestic sources. We can't use gas, you know, from the West Coast or even from the Gulf Coast uh, unless, uh, you know, unless I don't know how you would do it. Yes, the Jones Act does make it more difficult, but I don't think it makes it impossible by any means. And I think it would still be cheaper in the long run. Do we need to, you know, change the Jones Act? Absolutely. Uh, but I mean, this is that was just my take on it, Brad. Oh, is it being used as a red herring about imports? I, you know, I don't know. I, uh, the Jones Act does make it a little bit tougher. You can't go direct from a U.S. port uh, up to Alaska if you don't have a Jones Act ship, and there are no LNG tankers out there, to my knowledge, that that meet the Jones Act's requirements. So, as you say, you can't go direct from the Gulf Coast. But 
Um, you can There is a little known, little known workaround around that. There is a Mexican export facility uh, under construction uh, that will be fed by U.S. gas, um, and will be and will will be reliant on on U.S. gas. And so you can use that. Uh, you can use that from the Gulf Coast. There's also another Mexican facility on the West Coast uh, in Baja on Baja. Uh, that is fed by U.S. gas, run by run by a, a U.S. Uh, utility, uh, and that's one of the one of the uh, um, one of the options that they're talking about for Alaska. So, yeah, I, it makes things a little bit tougher, uh, but it certainly doesn't prevent uh, uh, LNG uh, from coming in. The other way that people have talked about the about the Jones Act is, you know, the the solution that some say, well, let's just, let's just tanker it off the North slope. Let's just do LNG gasification on the North slope, put it into tankers up on the North slope and bring it down. And then people say, well, you can't do that because of the Jones act. Well, there's another reason that you can't do that. I, the companies look, have looked at it a lot of times and there's a draft issue draft in the sense of depth issue, uh, up there. You'd have to do something. Uh, yeah, to, to, deal, can't to, scrape to out, deal with that. can't scrape out the bottom of the ocean up there. People, the free, the environmentalists would have a freak show over it and uh, you can't do it on shore. You'd have to do it way, way offshore. You'd have to find some facility to be able to do it in deep water. And that's part of the problem. Yeah. So it's so, I mean, so I think the, I think the LNG issue or the, the Jones Act issue is sort of a, uh, a pebble uh, in the, in the stream. I mean, the other thing, the LNG industry does does trades all the time. So you may contract with a Gulf Coast with a Gulf Coast company, but your delivery may come from LNG produced from Indonesia uh, or from Australia or from someplace else because they just do swaps uh, to do that. So it's I, I, I don't think I don't think the Jones Act is a is a significant uh, impediment. If your if your goal was I got to have it from an LNG plant in the U.S. Gulf Coast on U.S. soil, and if that's what's got to be delivered to me in Alaska. That's your goal, yeah. Then it's an impediment. But, but if your goal is I want U.S. source gas, you got the two Mexican facilities that can do that. Uh, or if your goal is I just want cheap gas <laughs> on the world market, then you can do swaps and and get it delivered that way. Well, so, and I, I heard this a couple times from several different politicians. I think four, maybe three or four of them said this. Well, we're we'd be at their mercy. They could shut off the gas at any time. And I'm like. Who is shutting off gas? I mean, we're not buying it from Russia. We're buying it on the open market. Who is out there saying, I've got a contract with you, but I'm not going to deliver because who is they? I mean, that's where, you know, I understand that there's, you know, a, a little bit of paranoia is not a bad thing, but who is the they that you keep talking about? And I heard a lot of politicians talking about that. And it just sounded like somebody had fed them something that they were just kind of repeating back. And, and I couldn't really get an answer. Yeah, it's sort of it's sort of a back end. I support the Cook Inlet. Now, give me the give me the arguments. <laughs> give me the arguments that I that I need to be able to back to back that statement up. I mean, it was sort of like John Sims said at one point, well, the the Army base or the Air Force base or, or Joyce J Bear, Joint Base Elmendorf Richardson, that they've said they don't want they don't want non-US gas in here. They want they want to be able to rely on Really, John? I think they're just concerned about costs. I don't really think they're concerned about 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 sources. And the third largest LNG producer in the world, if you really want to get concerned about it, the third largest LNG producer in the world is is our ally uh, Australia, just across the Pacific Ocean, and Canada has sources of supply. So I, I that's a pebble. It's not a boulder yeah, that gets yeah. in the way of. That's what I, I keep hearing it, and I'm like, this just doesn't seem like this makes any sense to me. I mean, who's gonna who's gonna say? I'm going to sucker you into it. I don't know. All right. We're continuing now. Brad Keithley, uh, weekly top three continues. Uh, the machinations inside the permanent fund board. Um, I mean, it makes Buster Keaton uh, look, you know, look like a, a brain surgeon at this point. It's uh, it's just it's astonishing to watch. Uh, we saw this whole thing, this most recent vote come down. Now Ellie Rubenstein is leaving, but she made a vote before she left the room. And I mean, I don't know what is going on here, Brad, but give us your thoughts. You know, Michael, last week on the show, we talked about Ethan Schutt's reappointment. And I raised the question, is this a good thing or a bad thing? And I sort of made the point. It sort of puts an, it sort of keeps the status quo in place. It couldn't get much worse 
Uh, and, and, and so it sort of draws a line under, under everything. I was wrong. <laughs> it got, yeah. in, in the span of one week, it got a lot worse. Um, and it's just, I mean, I, Jason Brinney said one thing and the FT, the financial times, the London based financial times, the, the major, there's the wall street journal and the financial times and maybe Bloomberg out there in the world. Those are the three major financial presses. Uh, and the Financial Times ran another article, <laughs> another not very complimentary article about Alaska and his permanent fund board. And J Jason Bruni um, made a comment that wasn't picked up by the Alaska press, uh, but made a comment that just floors me and does more, I think, to explain why this board needs to be restructured than anything else. Here's the comment. Ellie is the exact, this is Bruni. Ellie is the exact type of person we should want on the permanent fund. She has the connection. She understands the industry. Here's the key sentence. She frankly has more knowledge about the industry than the other trustees combined. Said Bruni, the new chairman. More knowledge. Now, this is Ellie Rubenstein, who. 36-year-old uh, Ellie Rubenstein. Who, who, has, who can tap into her father's knowledge, but I'm not sure on her own there's a whole lot of knowledge there. She is. She frankly hasn't demonstrated a lot of it. A lot of a lot of skill set around this, but she. This is Bruni. She frankly has more knowledge about the industry than the other trustees combined. Does that give you a warm and fuzzy feeling about the board that's running your, you know, seventy million dollar, seventy billion dollar um, investment fund? That that Ellie Rubenstein, the now departed Ellie Rubenstein, for good reason that Ellie Rubenstein has more knowledge about the industry than the other trustees combined. It, it sure as heck doesn't give me a warm and fuzzy feeling. It, you know, sends chills yeah. for me. Where's the, where's the, where are the professional folks who are supposed to be dealing with this? I mean, come on, this is oof. It, it, I mean, again, we go back to the other boards out there, the two Texas boards, the two Texas permanent fund boards, that deal with their, their K through 12 system and deal with their university system. Those boards have a statutory requirement that, that, that members of the board have substantial knowledge and experience in the field of investing because they recognize that, that a board like that it should be inwardly focused, should be focused on not a community board, worried about, you know, what this group thinks or that group thinks, but should be focused like a laser on producing the best returns. And, and to do that, you need people on the board to be giving this guidance, to do the allocations, to do the things that the board does. You need to be, you need to have people who have substantial knowledge and experience. That's what their, that's what their statute says, substantial knowledge and experience about the investment industry. And, and now <laughs> Jason Bruni is admitting that Ellie Rubenstein, who I would not rank in the you know my all-time top tier of investment advisors, Ellie Rubenstein has more knowledge about the industry than the other trustees combined. If there was ever a sentence that encapsulated what's gone wrong, it's that it's that sentence. But wait, there's more. <laughs> it gets better. Oh, it gets better. Dur during during the week. Not only did Ellie Rubenstein resign, and not only did did Jason Bruni make that comment. But they had a coup. I mean, and it's not it's just it's not just me using that word. Craig Richards, who's on the board, uh, uh, used that word when he described the surprise, at least to him, election of new officers at, at the at the last meeting outside of the normal election of officers you have at the annual meeting. Ethan Shutt, who had been the chairman. Uh, who was the chairman elected at the last annual meeting, had been reappointed by the governor by the time of this board meeting. There was a span of uncertainty, but had been reappointed appointed by the governor by the time of this board meeting, was at the meeting. And at the meeting, the first item on the agenda was, was election of new officers outside of the, well, outside of the election uh, at, the annual, at, the, at the annual meeting. And they elected... Uh, Jason Bruni, who now admits, who now says that that the departed Ellie, Ellie Rubenstein knew more, knows more than everybody else about the thing they're supposed to know about. Um, they elected Jason Bruni as the new chairman, and Adam Crum, who you know for whatever reason is the revenue commissioner, not because he actually does anything about revenue, but for whatever reason is the revenue commissioner. 
Adam Crum uh, as, as vice chairman. That's the new leadership. Craig Richards described that as a coup. At, at the election outside of the normal board cycle, the election outside of the normal cycle, and the installation of somebody who admits that he doesn't know much about the industry. Right. Uh, the election of, of, of that person and Adam Crum as chair and vice chair. It's the, well, the reason, and the reason why he said part of it was a coup is because wait, Ellie Rubenstein is resigning, but her parting shot out the door was to vote for Brune on the way. I mean, it was just like, how could you know you're going to resign? And you're like, well, I'm going to vote for this person on the way out the door. She and, knew she knew she was going to resign. Did, exactly. She, she didn't announce it until the end of the meeting. Yeah. So so you've got you've got this vote that's four a four to two vote. Would have still been three to two, but but it's a it's a four to two vote. It's a disputed vote. Ellie voting, thinking, you know, everybody thinking, well, she's still on the board, so sure she can vote. And then at the end, she's announcing that she's leaving. And she and obviously she knew that before, you know, before she it wasn't a spur of the moment decision at the end of the meeting. Oh, I'm gonna resign too. Um, yeah, it's I mean, it's it it is it is the keystone cops. The board has become the Keystone Cops incarnate. It's fun. I mean, if you're a politico or you like that sort of political drama, it's sort of humorous, like a Keystone Cops show, it's sort of humorous to watch. But this is a board that has control of, of, of Alaska's major asset, $70 billion, $70 billion investment fund, the one that that all sorts of people are, are relying on. People who want to people who want to you know spend money by the government, people who want PFDs, everybody's sort of looking to that fund to, 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 to maximize. And now we got, you know, now we got people admitting they don't know what they're doing on the board, that they're not expert in the, in the industry. We got, we got a coup going on. This board needs to be restructured. That needs to be, you know, if somebody's not already drafted the pre-filed bill, they sure as hell need to be doing it. And that needs to be HB1 or SB1 or maybe HB and SB1. <laughs> uh, uh, in 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 the next legislature, and and people who are running for office need to acknowledge that that's a that that's a that that's a huge issue. This board, this board, I mean, they're making the ADA board look good. <laughs> yeah, it's well, it's I mean, again the number one asset that feeds the state government, that does the permanent fund, that does you know the the dividend, that does everything else. And you got a bunch of people bumbling around in the dark. We need somebody in there who has the expertise. And and the problem is, is that it's become, it seems like in, in the last 10, 15 years, it's become more politicized than ever before. We'd never really heard much about this. The permanent fund board kind of worked in the background. It wasn't a big thing. The news media didn't report on it. It wasn't a, you know, and now. Uh, it's, you know, like you said, it's the Keystone cops. Everybody, everybody knows what's going on. They've got email leaks and this and that. And the other thing, it's like, they're creating a problem at this point. They, they are Michael. And it's, and it's, you know, we hadn't heard of it in part because it wasn't as important, um, uh, to the state, uh, as it's grown to be now. Uh, but also in part because we had bankers and we had investment people on there and we had people who actually understood what they were doing. And those people, those people aren't flashy people. They're pretty boring people. I mean, they wear gray suits. They wear they wear they wear white shirts. They they they're just fairly boring people, and they go about their business. And you know, they have in the modern age, they have screens in front of them, and they're looking at investment opportunities, and they're looking at movements in the market. And they're looking, and and they're just fairly boring people. What we've got on there now are wannabe politicians. Adam Crum, who wants to be governor. Jason Bruni, who may want to be. Governor Ryan Anderson, who's probably sitting there going, what the hell am I doing here? You know, I, I should be out building bridges or putting roads back together or worrying about snow removal. But, but you know, for some reason I'm here. Um, Ethan Shutt, who's a nice guy, but, but frankly, I, you know, is not an investment advisor. Uh, Craig Richards, who is, you know, who is, who is sort of Alaska's equivalent of Machiavelli, you know, having been in the Walker administration and, been part of the shenanigans there and now over, you know, advising Dunleavy and all. Uh, you, you've just got people on there who really, you know, who are, who are personalities, who are big personalities and want to do things and they're political and want to maneuver. And, you know, when there's, when there's not something to be maneuvered, they, right. get, they, they, they create things to maneuver around. 
have coups and things. Well, it's it's like they're using it as a is it like a, a a visible stepping stone to the next great right? I mean, that's the thing. They're using certainly like, the I mean, case for Crumb. Yeah, I mean, I'm using it as a stepping stone for the next direction that I'm going to take the career or whatever. Whereas before, you know, five years ago, ten years ago, I couldn't have named a single person who was probably on the permanent fund board at the time, just because it was so. Like you said, innocuous, boring, behind the scenes, people who just did their job and didn't do it. It's just become more politicized. Yeah, a resume builder, says Ryan, says Brian. Yeah, I mean, that's what it is. Oh, look, I can check it off my resume now. That's not what it was for. No, it's not what it's for. And it's not, it's not, I mean, that's the sort of stuff. I, I wrote a column in the landmine a few weeks ago that said, is the is the chaos on the permanent foreign permanent fund board costing Alaska's Alaskans money? And my conclusion was, yes, it is. Because they're taking the eye, their eye off the ball. And when you look at their own benchmarks and the performance of the fund against the benchmarks, they're falling short uh, of their own benchmarks, particularly the benchmark that is CPI plus five, uh, the rate of inflation plus 5%, which is, the, which is the standard that we're using now for POMV draws. They're falling short of replacing that. So what that does is, is send the permanent fund into, into gradual decline on a, on a, on a real dollar basis. And, and I, you know, the guys who, who came in gray suits and were boring and just had meetings and, you know, sort of, you know, did what they were supposed to do and went home and didn't try to, you know, flash in the newspapers. Those guys produced, you know, went through some periods of, uh, went through some tough times as the total market, as the overall market did. But generally you know, speaking, they produced, you know, solid returns against, against those benchmarks. Now we got a group who, you know they're they're too busy fighting amongst themselves to really focus on the things that they need to be focusing on, and we're falling short. So we need we need the gray suits back, right? We need the we need the the people in the gray suits and the white shirts who are very boring, and who you know speak in monotone and 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 just you know show up at the meeting, do what they're supposed to do, and uh, and go on. We need those guys back, and that's not who Dunleavy's appointing. That's not right. frankly who Walker right. appointed. So we, we need those and we need so we need to restructure the board to 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 require the expertise that you see on the boards down in Texas. We need we need that statutory obligation of expertise and we need legislative. We need a, a, a legislative approval of new board members, legislative confirmation of new board members. So we have a vetting process, a public vetting process that goes on. Welcome back to the program. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets is our guest uh we're continuing now number three of the weekly top three uh and the question is subsidies versus tax credits brad is that i mean it that the you know uh, all we hear about is how the government can come in and save the sector the economy this specific special thing this deal and why we need the government to do it instead of just getting out of the way but you know hey um, so here we are uh, watching this, and this article came out. Uh, let's talk about it. So an article by, by Sean McGuire in the ADN um, talking about uh, Senate Bill 189, which the governor allowed to go into effect without his signature, which is just sort of an odd thing to me. Maybe, you know, he was out of, out of the country or something, but you know those things in advance. So you either sign them or you don't. But anyway, let it go into effect without his signature. It's a bill by Julie Colomb that passed the legislature that provides for a child tax credit um, uh, for corporations that that spend money on uh, uh, child care facilities. They can take a credit for those costs against their against their corporate income taxes in Alaska and and essentially recover uh, uh, a portion of the costs uh, uh, through that means. The, head, the, the title of the article is Alaska Child Care Advocates Hope New Law and 7.5 Million Subsidies Will Help Beleaguered Sector. The 7.5 million uh, refers to a, the, to a subsidy that was also included in the budget. In addition to the, to the credit, uh, there was a subsidy that was in the, uh, was it, that was in the appropriations bill. Uh, so sort of a Kickstarter, if you will, to the, to the child care industry to subsidize them uh, uh, while the well, hopefully, at least in Cologne's mind, hopefully the top child care tax credit uh, kicks in. Here's a statement that Cologne made during the article that uh, that bothers me, and, I, and and it bothers me on a big scale, not just not just with respect to child care uh, uh, tax credits. Cologne argued 
that relying on government wage subsidies subsidies is a dangerous game. She suggested tax credits and expanded family assistance were better ways were better ways to stabilize the sector. There really isn't the point I want to make here is there really isn't any difference in terms of in terms of impact on the state budget between subsidies and tax credits. Subsidies are payments made by the state out of the general fund to right. somebody. Tax credits are are enabling somebody to short you revenue, keep it for themselves, but short you revenue. And that ends up, you know, shorting your budget. You don't have the same amount of revenue that you had before. So the impact on the budget is the same. I mean, the deficit created by the two is the same. But there's a huge difference, huge difference between the two. Um, subsidies are in the budget. You see them when you're going through the appropriations process. The governor can line item veto them. The legislature can vary them up and down uh, in any given appropriations bill. They're, they're sitting there and they compete with other, with other expenditures of money. And, and, and on an annual basis, you're sort of making the judgment about whether we need to continue this program or don't need to continue this program. Do we need to continue it at the same amount? Is there someplace else we should be putting the money? All sorts of judgments that go into the, go into the appropriations process. Tax credits sort of set off the books. They sort of set off the side. They're established by statute. And, and really, when you think through it, it's, 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 a, it's a designated, dedicated, well, designated fund, at least, in a, in a way, in the sense that, that the, the beneficiary of the tax credit sort of can take it without having to go through the appropriations process every year. Right. ConocoPhillips. Right. ConocoPhillips is going to be a big beneficiary. Out of the out of the child care tax credits, they're gonna they're gonna run a child care facility for their employees, and then they're gonna take the cost of that as a tax credit against their corporate against their corporate income tax. It's another way of subsidizing another way of subsidizing the oil companies in the state. But but they're gonna be a big beneficiary out of this. But they don't need to worry about it going through the appropriations process every year. They're just gonna be sitting out there going ka-ching, 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 spend, get a tax credit, spend, get a tax credit, spend, get a tax credit. Without uh, sort of out of public sight, out of out of public view, there are a couple of other things. I mean, they're they're easily expandable. You don't, as opposed to oh, we need to go from seven point five million subsidy to you know a ten million dollar subsidy and all of the stuff that that entails, and again, surviving a governor's line item veto and all of the public scrutiny that entails. Oh, I'm going to change the the tax code from point you know zero one to point zero two, and 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 get that bill through, and that's. That is a lot easier, at least, at least it's a lot more out of public view of what's going on than, than subsidies are. So, and, and sort of an example of all this, tax expenditures at the federal level are over a trillion dollars. These sorts of tricks at the federal level are over a trillion dollars. They alone, closing all of those, would result in a balanced budget at the federal level or close to a balanced budget. I don't, we, may have, we may have gone over that. In, in recent times, but, just but all the tax is closing all the tax credit loopholes, yeah. it, you know, essentially these hidden revenue pieces, but, but nobody, nobody thinks about them because they're, because they're, Oh, they're that's, that's the tax code. That's too confusing. Don't bother me with that. And, and it's just all, all over at the side. And so they can grow. I mean, once you get a tax, a, a, a tax credit built in there, you can say, uh, well, this is just like the child care tra tax credit. And, and, you know, that's a good thing. So let's let's just do another one. And so they sort of grow like like topsy over time once you once you get started down that road. I mean, if anybody really wants to think about the impact of tax credits, think about the reimbursable tax credits we did for Cook Inlet producers back in the early 20 teens. That's right. a large part of the deficit we ran up uh, in the early 20 teens, uh, uh, those oil and gas tax credits. But they weren't they weren't going through the annual appropriations process. They weren't, you know, people weren't reviewing them and deciding whether it was a good use of funds or not. They just existed out there. So I, I think Cologne's got it backwards. And I think, I think advocates of tax credits are, are among the most dangerous among us uh, because they're setting up these procedures that move deficit creating fiscal measures off the books, out of public sight and move them into a mode where they're 
they're, they operate automatically. They're they're permanent. You can't you can't you don't you don't review them as part of your as you, as part of your annual appropriations process. So I'm I'm concerned uh, that we've done this with uh, child care tax credits. I'm concerned that we have a legislator who says that that tax credits are better ways to uh, are better ways to handle fiscal measures. They're both subsidies. Don't 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 confuse yourself. Both a direct subsidy included in the appropriations process and a tax credit created outside the appropriations process are the same thing. They are both subsidies, uh, but one is is much easily, much more easily protected uh, than the other, and much because, more damaging because, because have, of that. Yeah, because it doesn't have to fight with all the other dollars every year as they duke out the budget. It's not. It's just a credit, so it's not actual revenue quote unquote that people see in the account that they then have to fight over who's expending it where it's just money that they keep and it never goes into the account so it's out of sight out of mind is what you're saying and so it's easy to do and then if it's not subject to that appropriation then it becomes easy to highlight and i mean look i'm all about i'm all about legal you know whatever however you can make your tax avoidance as legal and as broad as possible i'm all about that but the question becomes is when is it government's responsibility to do all these things and that's the question that's not being asked i mean this article goes on and on and on about it but and, and i it quotes the chambers of commerce and all this other kind of things and i'm like you know people the problem here is is that we've got in this instance child care specifically and i know this departs from brad's main point on this but the problem is is that we've got an industry that's been so you know inculcated by the government and regulation and oversight and all this other kind of stuff that you know little old betty june down the street can't watch your kids anymore because she doesn't have all the state mandated whatever to do it when you used to do that, when you were, when you know, your folks did it, they just had paid Betty Jean five bucks an hour or whatever it was to do it uh, because she was retired and liked the extra income and everything. I mean, why are you adhering to all these deals? You know, is it because the only way you can get the subsidy is to go to a state authorized child care place? Otherwise, you have to pay for it out of pocket. And so now it again creates a constituency to have to do that. I mean, this is a this is a bigger issue here specifically with this. But you're right, Brad, I guess is what I'll say to that. But but this is a debate, Michael. I, I, I accept all of that and understand all of that. But it's a debate that we've had one time and now we won't have it again. You want to know why? Right. Because, because we've moved the subsidy off the books into a credit. And so now it'll be off the books. We won't we won't have these subsidies show up right. in the appropriations process because it'll be off there, off in a credit. So we've had this debate one time. You know, some people prevailed on it, some people didn't prevail on it. Now it's gone. Now it's off the books. Yeah. And we, no, we won't and we won't have it again. Yeah, I mean, both things again, they're not mutually exclusive. We're both right uh, in that regard. And I and I think that's uh you know, that's part of the problem here. We had Julie on here a couple weeks ago. We talked to her about this and I mean, I didn't I mean, I wasn't beating her up on it or anything, but you know, at some point the, the part of the problem is is that government has gotten so involved in, you know, most aspects of our lives. And this childcare thing is an interesting thing because, you know, we probably can remember when mom and dad paid the little old lady down the street or the homemaker down the street a few bucks to watch us occasionally, you know, or whatever, if we needed to when we were younger. I mean, in my life, we we all grew up pretty quick and we were pretty self-reliant and we didn't need to necessarily need a babysitter too much. But, you know, it, it did happen. And then what we've seen happen is it's gotten to the point to where we become dependent on government because they've mandated, well, if you want this subsidy if you want this credit if you want this extra payment to help you with your child care then you can only do it through state authorized child care providers which of course drives the market up and up and shuts out the little old lady down the street because she's not going to go through all those hoops to do that she was doing it for a few extra bucks and be nice and you know to have something to do it but she's not going to jump through all those hoops to do that and so you've you've shortened the market you've shrunk the market of available providers by creating this this whole mess to begin with and it's just this doom loop where it just gets worse and worse and worse and then the only people who can afford to do it are the people who are receiving the subsidies from the government brad no that's right michael that's right and 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 it is i mean we have narrowed the market and we've narrowed it down to 
to uh, to those who are who are subsidized and, and and we've given them a price advantage by subsidizing them so they can they can beat out Betty Jean you know Betty Jean isn't going to do it for free uh, and now we have government subsidized uh, providers who uh, who are going to have a cost advantage over over Betty Jean and and all the other private providers there's one other issue in this that that I didn't get to in the in the segment but grates me and that is who's paying for these subsidies Right. Well, I'll, I'll tell you who's paying for these subsidies. It's being it's being paid for through PFD cuts. That's the revenue source. That's the marginal revenue source that the that the legislature is using. So, so who does that mean paying pay, is paying for it? Well, it means middle and lower income Alaska families are paying are paying for it. Do you think the only people using it are middle and lower income Alaska families? Of course not. Those in the top twenty percent are using it. Maybe some non residents are going to take advantage of it. Um, uh, people who are up here for the military or, or otherwise uh, up here uh, and, and, and not residents of, of the state, all companies are going to benefit from it. You know, obviously Conoco is going to, you know, pursue it uh, as, as part of its operation uh, to enhance you know, its uh, uh, employment uh, for, uh, for its employees or enhance the environment for its employees. They're all benefiting from it, but who's paying for it? It's going to be paid for by middle and lower income Alaska families. And that's just, I mean, that's it. That's another huge gripe to me. If we're going to make, if we're going to do something like this, if we're going to make the decision that we're going to subsidize childcare, then, then every Alaskan who's, I mean, chambers of commerce, top 20% corp, uh, uh, corporations, companies, they say it's important to them. They're, they're companies. Well, they ought to be paying for it then. They ought to be paying a share of it then. A share of the cost of the subsidy, as opposed to as opposed to recovering those costs only from middle and lower income Alaska families through PFD cuts. And now we're going to have people say, "Well, you know, middle and lower income Alaska families need more government services." Why? Because we're cutting the PFD. We're taking away we're taking away one of their income sources in order to in order to in order to to pay for this stuff. It's sort of you know, it's sort of its own doom loop going on. Right. We're, making, we're making life worse for middle and lower income Alaska families. Then we say, oh, we need more government services to make life better for them. But we're going to take more money from them in order to make life better for them. Oh, and by the way, the top 20 percent non-residents and oil companies get to be right. free riders. Well, on that see, it's even worse because they're taking that tra the transfer is happening from the private sector to the public sector. Right. Because they're taking the money out of the private sector to say, oh, we need to make life better for you. So we'll do it through the government sector, which is less efficient. Does it? It's malinvestment, essentially. And, and that's how they keep doing it. That doom loop continues. But the money keeps coming out of the private sector to the where the public sector can spend it because we know better than you how you should spend your money to make it better for you. And that it just keeps going and going and going. That's the problem. Well, no. That's one of the problems. That's part. That's a, that's that's part of the problem. But but a big subset of that problem is is who in the private sector the money's being taken from, and it's being taken yeah. from from middle and lower income Alaska families exclusively. I mean that's that's who gets PFD. So that's who's bearing the cost of PFD cuts, and and you know the top twenty percent oil and non residents are going to are taking advantage uh, of of this as well. Wow. Why? You know, the chamber's essentially, let's focus on this for a moment. The chamber's essentially going, our members are, in, are mostly in the top 20%, mostly companies. They want this. Are you willing right. to pay for it? No, no, we're not willing to use PFD cuts, but we want this. We so want give, us, give us another free benefit from government and, and put it on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families. It's, uh, it's one of the reasons I'm no longer a member of any chamber. I mean, it's just... yeah. They're as bad as labor unions in that regard. Yeah, no, I mean exactly. Who are they looking to to fix the problems? Not themselves. We look to government to fix the problem. We couldn't come together ourselves and fix it. Um, all right, uh, Brad, uh, we're out of time. One minute left. Final thoughts before I let you go. Permanent fund board. That's the big. That's the big one of the week. Cook in has been solved. Let's go to the permanent fund board. That sucker needs to be addressed, and we need to make big steps quickly to get the Keystone cops out of there and to yeah. get the grownups back in the room. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree with that. Again, let's go back to the boring old days when we never heard about the permanent fun board because they were just doing their nine to five and going home and being boring, which is great and earning a great rate of return. All right, Brad Keithley. Thank you so much, my friend. Appreciate it. 
Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keith Lake, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.